I've been coding since the age of 14. And over the past nine years, I landed software engineer internship offers at companies like Amazon, Shopify, and HP. And by the time I graduated college at age 21, I landed multiple six-figure full-time software engineering job offers. And over the past year, I've worked with hundreds of aspiring software engineers to help them land their dream job in tech. In this video, I'm gonna give you every piece of brutally honest advice I wish I knew nine years ago when I started coding. You'll learn why software engineering internships aren't actually enough, what no one tells you about working at FANG, and the most common mistakes I see every single computer science student or aspiring software engineer make today and how to avoid them. This video will save you a decade of trial and error. Now, before I break down why your internships simply aren't enough and why you're not ready for FANG, my first piece of advice is something I see people mess up all the time. And that piece of advice is this, your programming skills are not enough. I see so many people have the mistaken belief that they can just work on interesting projects, follow YouTube tutorials, even do online courses, and just having that programming knowledge in their mind is enough to land an amazing job in tech. But that is completely not the case. See, your coding knowledge, of course, does matter. I mean, they're hiring you for a reason. It's to build interesting products using software engineering. But most people, and you included as well, tend to underemphasize the importance of just playing to your strengths and actually understanding the job market. People don't understand the importance of selling yourself to employers to actually land an offer compared to just your raw engineering skills. Basically, people don't understand the game of getting a job in tech. I have many friends who are incredible programmers. These are people who have won hackathons, they've built insane products, but they're still unemployed or they're not working a great job that they're happy with. And on the other side, I know people who are pretty shit coders, but also have great six-figure job offers. So how how do you square this reality? It's simple. Coding is one set of skills, but selling yourself to get a job is an entire one as well. And the best way to think about this is Steve Wozniak versus Steve Jobs. Let's start with Wozniak, the less famous of the two. Wozniak is the one who actually built most of Apple's products in the early days. He was the son of a very successful engineer, and he lived and breathed engineering. Without him, Apple would have done nothing. But on the flip side, you had Steve Jobs, who was the king of selling himself and marketing. See, Steve Jobs also was great at engineering compared to like the average person, obviously. Compared to Wozniak, he couldn't really do much. And the fundamental mistake here is that when people hear the story, they think, oh, why couldn't Wozniak just go on his own and make his own company? He would have probably been as successful without Steve Jobs. The builders use Wozniak's role as way more important than Jobs, but that is not the case at all. And to show this, there was a time early on when Wozniak and Jobs built their first Apple computer. And Wozniak's plan was to distribute the blueprint of this just to everybody in their computer club, just for free, to release the idea to the world and just open source it for everyone to work on. Whereas Jobs had the idea of licensing it for $500 and actually building a product and a company around it. Do you see the dynamic? Without Jobs, Wozniak would have been a great engineer, but there would be no Apple today. Then we go to the salesman archetype. These people are excellent at selling themselves. They're masters of persuasion persuasion, marketing, sales. They know how to convince someone to hire them or to buy their product. Yet they often lack skills when it comes to building or delivering what they've sold. That is the archetype of the salesman. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the builder is less important or the salesman is less important. From my perspective, they're both extremely vital, but you need to set aside the ego of thinking that, hey, sales doesn't matter, building is what actually matters. Because I see a lot of builders out there who have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. They think, oh, just because I can build interesting projects, that's enough to actually walk away with the job in tech, which is not true at all. They see selling yourself as wrong. And to be completely honest, I would rather be the salesman every single time. Because at the end of the day, the salesman has a job, but the builder doesn't. And even if the salesman struggles to actually do that job, they have a job. So what's the takeaway from this? The takeaway is that if you're a builder, you need to work on your sales skills. And if you're a salesman, you probably need to work on your building skills. But most of you guys are probably builders. And because of that, you need to directly work on the software engineer job acquisition and hiring process independently of your programming skills. You can't just spend months in an IDE and expect to walk away with an amazing software engineering job offer. The world does not work like that. Now, the second piece of advice I wish I knew nine years ago when I started coding is that you must hold yourself to a higher standard than you're used to. Your standard of work is most likely not good enough for a software engineering job or even for a computer science degree. See, back in high school, when I just started coding, I would not pay attention at all in school. Instead of actually listening, taking notes, and doing what the instructor wanted, I would just talk to my friends, play on my phone, and just not pay attention at all. And then the night before the exam, or often the hour before the exam, I would just blitz through the textbook, utilize my friends, and walk away with decent grades. That strategy actually worked in high school. And then I started my computer science degree at college. And guess what happens? 
I did the exact same approach. In my first computer science project, I did the same thing. A couple days before it was due, I just blitzed through it, glanced through the rubric, did the bare minimum of work and submitted it, expecting to get an A. But guess what I got? I ended up getting a C on my first computer science project. And this wasn't even a hard class. This was CS200, one of the earliest classes at my university. In that moment, I realized that my approach of just sticking to the bare minimum of effort, of working on it the day before it was due, just fitting those bare minimum requirements, that level of standard was no longer good enough. That I couldn't just show up and learn everything last minute and expect to do well in my degree. And this wasn't just for my degree. This also took place for my internships and my full-time job. See, the secret here is to train the muscle of not expecting to be told what to do and instead finding problems and voluntarily fixing them before even being asked. Throughout my year of internships, when I did Shopify, Amazon, Shopify for an entire year straight, I knew 20 to 30 interns during that time and I was able to see who got return offers and who didn't. And honestly, the biggest defining aspect of whether someone got a return offer or didn't is whether they over delivered even when they were not told what to do. These are people who didn't talk themselves up, who didn't tell their managers that they were going to do so much stuff, but instead were very humble and just over delivered beyond what was actually expected. They went above and beyond what the team actually wanted. So what is the general principle here? You must under promise and over deliver. But the more important aspect is that you over deliver. Here are a couple of examples where you can use this principle. The first one is when you're doing a computer science project in your university or as part of a bootcamp. If you're building a project for a class, over delivering means you start the project a month early, even beyond what you think you actually need to do. So you give yourself time to bring it to the TA or instructor, have them review your code and roast it as much as possible. You try to find every single way it can be improved and do that rather than sticking to the bare minimum. If you imagine your standards as a floor and a ceiling and a floor is the bare minimum of what they ask and a ceiling is the most you could possibly do, you always go more to the ceiling rather than stick to the floor. And my approach back in the day was, hey, if I just passed the floor and I was in the house, great, I would call it a day. But later on, I realized that going for the ceiling, and maybe you'll never hit the ceiling, but going 70, 80%, 98% as close as you could to the ceiling, that is what gets you results. Here's the thing. Most people are trying to get an A in their courses, right? And an A demands 90% correct. And the only way to get at least 90% consistently is to deliver 120%. And then based on uncertainty, things you just inevitably end up missing, tight deadlines, you're going to move down to 95%. But if you aim for 90%, you're inevitably going to only get 70 or 80%. Now, if we bring it back to an internship or working as a software engineer, this means building additional features or pushing a project farther than was actually asked. Even if no one asks you to do it, you do it anyway. You take a genuine interest in your work. And sure, sometimes taking that genuine interest won't help or really do anything. There were multiple times where I built an additional feature in my internships that ended up not being used at all. We just realized that after I built it, that code wasn't needed anyway. There was even one time in my Shopify internship where I spent an entire day building a feature. I was about to push the code. And then the senior engineer took one look at my code and turned to me and said, I'm on. I forgot to tell you, we actually don't need that at all. So I was forced to just delete the PR and just backspace the code. Can you imagine you spend five hours working on something to try to build an additional feature and go above and beyond within one second, it's no longer needed. And obviously that is not an ideal situation, but the sentiment is there. And I would rather do that, build three, four features, two end up not being necessary, but then two push me above and beyond compared to doing only zero or one. So what is the key? The key is that you just need to raise your standards. Go for that ceiling in everything you do when it comes to projects, your work at internships, your work as a full-time software engineer, and don't just stick to the floor because you always end up lower than you anticipated, inevitably. So if you aim high, you'll end up where you want to be. My next piece of brutally honest advice, and this is from someone who's worked at Fang companies, is that you are probably not ready for Fang. Now, I've spoken to over 200 computer science students and aspiring software engineers over the past six months, and 95% of them have FANG as their primary goal. That is the standard of company they want to work at. And why is this the case? Well, there are three reasons why I've seen that most people want to work at a FANG level company. The most obvious reason is the pay. The pay at these standards of companies is incredible for someone who's in their early 20s. On average, people who work at FANG level companies earn $170,000 per year annually in total compensation as an entry level software engineer, which is absolutely incredible. You're in the 99.9% .9 of income of someone your age if you land a FANG offer out of college at age 22. That is simply one of the biggest reasons people want to work at FANG. Now, the second reason I've seen why people have FANG as their number one outcome is because of the name brand of those companies. The prestige you get when you can write Meta or Google or Amazon on your resume. People perceive Fang to hold a certain weight. 
that if you have a fan company on your resume, you can automatically get interviews at other companies just because people perceive you to be extremely qualified to have that name in your resume. And also, your friends and family will think you're the sh**. Those top companies carry the same weight as Ivy League names as having Harvard on your resume. And the third reason why people are interested in working at those fang level companies is the work itself. If you're working at a company like Google, you're going to be surrounded by people who are the top of their field, and you're working in a fast-paced environment, solving really difficult, challenging problems. So if you're a Google software engineer, you're not going to spend your time answering support tickets that should have been outsourced 20 years ago. You're going to be solving the toughest problems of the day with other ambitious, intelligent other engineers. However, the thing is that these fan companies don't have any of those benefits for free. To get that offer, you have to be one of the best applicants because everybody has the same goal. Trust me, I've spoken to 200 plus computer science students inspire software engineers. Nearly every single person I talk to has the same goal as you. So why do you think that you can just get away with getting that offer with the minimal experience you have? It's difficult because when I talk to computer science students, I want them to be successful and I want them to aim high. I genuinely do. But unfortunately, some people are just not ready. See, Fang commands the best of the best. Only the brightest computer science students and software engineers make it to those companies. If you have no internship experience, no work experience, you haven't solved at least 100 lead code medium problems, and you haven't spent 10 to 15 hours working on your software engineering resume, you're most likely not ready for Fang. So what's the problem with having Fang as a goal when you don't stand a chance? I mean, there's probably a benefit of aiming super high, and then inevitably you'll end up somewhere along the way. The problem is simple. One, by aiming only for Fang, you're avoiding companies that you would have a shot for, but you just end up with no offers because you're aiming too high. See, a lot of people tend to overlook those great smaller companies that would provide a good lifestyle, but just aren't Fang level. And you can even use those as stepping stones before you make it to those name brand companies. And because you're avoiding all of that experience, you're spinning your wheels, making no progress. You're also setting yourself up for disappointment. Again, I've talked to hundreds of computer science students and aspiring software engineers, and a lot of people only apply to Google, Microsoft, Apple, Tesla, meta and when they inevitably get rejected they just get discouraged and feel like the game is rigged when they could have joined smaller companies and then worked their way up to those name brand companies over time so what's the key here well the key is to not give up on your goal of breaking into a fang level company but to recognize that you can do that down the line as long as you work towards it step by step by step now with my students i work with i call this idea the stairway to software heaven whenever they start working with me i look at their experience and tell them what tier of company should they be going for based on where they're currently at? Because if you have zero work experience, why the hell are you going for Google as your first job? It makes no sense. Instead, go for smaller insurance companies, hell, even IT companies, and leverage that step by step by step before worrying about those big, more competitive roles. Think about it this way. If you see the world of software engineering as a staircase, Fang is level three or four. And if you're on the ground level, level zero, you can't just vertically jump your way to three or four. If you try that, you're gonna be set up for failure. You're gonna keep jumping up and down over and over and over again, and you're gonna make zero progress whatsoever. But instead, if you just do one step, second step, third step, it is so much easier and you still end up at the outcome. So you must objectively analyze yourself. Stop spam applying to Fang roles. Don't even apply. If you're not worthy, if you don't have two or three internships on your resume, if you can't do Leco Mediums, then there's no point of applying to Fang. Instead, start with more accessible companies and then work your way up until you're actually ready. Now, if you're interested in working directly with me to land an amazing software engineering full-time job or internship, I actually run a school for software engineers called the Software Engineering Accelerator. We take exactly where you're at and help you achieve the next step. We've already helped dozens of students land amazing offers at companies like Adobe, LinkedIn, and Capital One. So check out the top link in the description if 2025 is the year that you're ready to lock in and land an amazing software engineering offer 100% guaranteed. Now, my next piece of advice that I wish I knew nine years ago when I started coding is that getting that internship or full-time offer isn't actually enough. Now, a lot of this advice was about getting that offer, but I want you to understand just because you have that internship or full-time offer, it doesn't mean that your life is completely set. Of course, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't focus on lead code, you shouldn't work on your resume, shouldn't get that offer. But I talked to a lot of people, and past me included, that had this idea that if they just get an offer, everything in their life is sorted. It's a very common mindset error I see. See, what is a job offer? A job offer is an offer to do a job. And if you get a job offer, that means you have to do that job, which means you have to spend 40 to 50 hours a week. You need to actually like doing it. If you hate coding, it doesn't matter how many software engineering job offers you get. You're going to hate that lifestyle in order to quit as soon as possible. And even if you don't quit, chances are you're not going to be that great at it because you're not going to take a genuine interest in your work. And most likely you'll be laid off or just never promoted. Now this happened to me in March of 2023. After my Shopify internship in the fall of 2022, I ended up getting a great six-figure return offer. It was fully remote, had great benefits, had a great work 
culture and I was overjoyed to actually get that return offer. I was so happy that I just let go of the software editor job acquisition process. I didn't worry about applying, interviewing, nothing after I got that return offer because what was the point? It was a remote offer. I could do whatever I want, be wherever I wanted. But then all of a sudden, they rug pulled me. In March of 2023, I got an email saying that they were sending the offer. That they just made a last minute decision that, hey, they couldn't give out too many offers and I was cut. And there was nothing I could say or do about it. And this was incredibly late in the new grant offer timeline. This was March. I was supposed to start in June. So what the hell was I supposed to do? And for that month, I was completely depressed. I had thought that this job offer was everything I wanted. I spent three months exulting in the fact that I had a six-figure remote offer at a great company. And as soon as that was taken away, I didn't know what to do. Of course, I jumped back on the interviewing train, interviewed at many, many companies. And finally, in April of 2023, I got another six-figure offer at a company in Madison, Wisconsin, where I went to school. And as soon as I got that offer, I can confidently say that was one of the greatest days of my entire life. I remember calling my parents, my brothers, my friends, telling them that this was amazing. I finally got another six-figure offer one or two months before I had to start working, which is insane. I wasn't going to be unemployed. I had an offer. One year later, I quit. The happiest day of my life was getting an offer, and I left it 12 months later. Why? How does that even make sense? I didn't realize that getting an offer means you have to work as a software engineer. And I'm not saying that I wish I didn't get that offer. Obviously, I was super happy that I was able to work at that company with a six-figure software engineer offer. All my bills are paid for. My lifestyle was great. I was able to travel. I was able to invest in coaching and other activities outside of work. And I was able to start building an investment portfolio and saving. So all of that was taken care of. But what I didn't realize on that day I got that offer was that this was just a ticket to start working for someone else 40 to 50 hours a week. And while the job was great, I loved having a stable income. It was still a nine to five. And if you don't enjoy that, then you're not going to last. It's not going to work out for you. My point is that don't delude yourself into thinking that once you get a job offer, you can just sit back and watch the sunrise of our grateful universe. A job offer is simply a ticket to dedicate 50% of your waking moments to achieve someone else's goal by building a product for them in exchange for a salary. And you give someone your best time of the day too. So it's nine to five. Those are the hours that you're most alert, that your brain actually works well. You're doing what someone else wants, which again is fine. If you want a salary and you enjoy working as a software engineer, then do that. I'm glad I did. But just think to yourself, is this what I actually want? And even if it is or it isn't, don't go in expecting everything in your life to be solid once you're working as a software engineer. What will happen once you finally get that offer is that you'll be elated for a few weeks. You'll tell all your friends and family. You'll make a cringy LinkedIn post updating your entire network that you got an offer. And your set of immediate problems right now will be taken care of. So you'll put food on the table, you'll be able to pay your bills, and you'll start saving which does put you ahead of a lot of people in this country. But you're going to trade that set of problems for a new set of problems. So now you're going to be stressed and anxious about not getting fired or not getting promoted and making your boss or employer happy. And this is also true in the world of business. So I left my full-time job and I was able to build a six-figure business in less than six months. And I thought that my life would be set once I hit that arbitrary $10,000 a month in profit. That's what everybody says, right? Everybody's like, how to make 10K a month to doing X, Y, and Z. I thought as soon as I hit that amount, I would be set. Everything would be happy. My entire life would be taken care of. But no, there are days where I'm more stressed out working in my own business, even though I make the same or more as I did as a software engineer, even though I thought that it wouldn't be the case, that everything would be sunshine, daisies. So would I go back? No, I'm happy where I am. I enjoy helping people get jobs in tech rather than necessarily doing the coding myself. But I wish I knew nine years ago and even one year ago that there is no arbitrary metric or achievement or offer or income that is going to take care of all of your life's problems. You have to work on those problems independently. And if you don't enjoy the journey, you're not going to enjoy the destination either. You'll have to trust me on that one. Now that you know the top pieces of brutal advice I wish I knew nine years ago when I started programming, how do you actually apply it? Watch this video next if you're planning on locking in and landing amazing software engineering your internship in 2025 so i can give you my step-by-step -step roadmap for actually pulling it off thank you guys for watching and i will see you in the next video